Let's start at the very beginning. A sore throat, a cough, and woo-ha. And in no time at all, there were one, two, three. And one went on a plane, took it overseas. 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 And that's how pandemics get started, you see. I know that some of this talk has appeared as text in the exhibition for the few who came to the museum and some has been in the journal. But I've tried to add bits and pieces here and there and I hope it will still be of interest. Finding cures for diseases has been a goal for man from prehistoric times. And these have been sought from magic, witchcraft, religion, and frequently from natural remedies. Sadly, pandemics have gone hand in hand with travel and trade. I learned recently that the plague of Justinian, which started in 541, was the beginning of the first plague pandemic. The disease afflicted the entire Mediterranean basin and persisted in Northern Europe and the Arabian Peninsula until 1549. Needless to say, there are no photographs going back there, but shown here is Saint Sebastian interceding with Christ for the life of a grave digger. It was the same bacterium that caused the first pandemic that was responsible for the Black Death. The Black Death, also known as the pestilence, the great mortality or the plague, was the deadliest pandemic recorded in human history. The Black Death resulted in the deaths of up to 75 to 200 million people worldwide. And it seems to have started in Central Asia. And for, from there, it was most likely carried by fleas, living on black rats that traveled on Genoese merchant ships. But current evidence indicates that once it came on shore, the Black Death was in large part spread by human fleas and the person-to-person -person contact, similar to COVID. There was a, a very good Channel 5 program about it, which I can give you the link to. In medieval Send and Ripley, home remedies handed down from one generation to the next would probably have been the most common form of medicine. But with Newark Priory on their doorstep, it's likely that one or more of the priors would have specialised in herbal remedies, and there might well have been a medicinal garden in the Priory grounds. Sadly, the records of the Priory have been lost, so we've no idea what part they played in times such as the Black Death. But we've got a little image here of the monk with his pestle and mortar. There were further outbreaks of plague during the late Middle Ages, and with other contributing factors, it took until 1500 for the European population to regain the level it stood at in 1300. We have no specific figures for Send and Ripley, but we do have information from the accounts of the manor of Isha in the Winchester pipe rolls, which have been transcribed by the Surrey Record Society and the book is, is now in our library. It seems the Black Death arrived in the West Country in 1348 and reached Surrey around Christmas time. It's estimated to, to have killed between 40 and 50% of the population. 22 deaths were recorded for the manor of Isha, which doesn't sound very much, but, these were only the unfree tenants where their lands had to be reallocated after their death. And sadly, the deaths of landless agricultural workers, their families and their children went unrecorded. So the number would have been much, much higher. It's hard to imagine that the story of Send and Ripley was very different with peddlers and sailors and itinerant monks and others traveling through the village with the ability to spread the disease. The Black Death meant that the harvest was not always gathered in and this caused hunger. But strangely, the standard of living for the surviving peasantry may well have improved in the years after the epidemic. 
because of the scarcity of labor, they could command a higher, higher price. This image is from a later period, but I think it's very charming and shows the harvest with, if you look very carefully, Newark Priory in the background. The plague did not just affect the country in the 14th century, but it rumbled on with sporadic outbreaks. In Guildford, epidemics occurred on and off from 1563 to 1661. And the plague was apparently more virulent in the summer, but seldom persisted through the winter. The young and the old were particularly at risk. Plague was carried from place to place by fleas or in the baggage of travellers. So Ripley, with travellers stopping at local inns, might well have been particularly susceptible. As I think it's well known, it was particularly devastating in London, where so many people were living at close quarters. And the well-to-do often left the city to escape infection. This slide is from one of the broadsheets that recorded the deaths. And you can see the coffins being taken off to a quick burial. Often the authorities tried remedies, some of them drastic and some that worked, but people didn't necessarily know why. For example, plague families were shut up in their houses. Clothes of victims were burnt after their death and houses were fumigated and whitewashed after their death, which obviously, as we know now, was killing some of the bacteria or cleaning the property out. Another course of epidemics was typhus, which was less fatal in the young and was often associated with troop movements and the billeting of soldiers in overcrowded quarters. Once again, one assumes this increased the risk in Ripley with troops moving from the city down to the coast. There were also encampments of troops in Send on a regular basis on Send Heath. So although the impact of the plague was declining during the 17th century, other epidemic diseases were still widespread, such as smallpox and influenza. Interesting here in this hospital ward, you can see all the windows are open. So obviously they knew that ventilation was important from quite an early time. Smallpox is thought to date back to Egypt from around the third century BC. The global spread of smallpox can be traced to the growth and spread of civilizations, exploration and expanding trade routes over the centuries. In the seventh century, Arab expansion spread smallpox to Northern Africa and then up into Spain and Portugal. And the Crusades spread it further into Europe. Smallpox was a devastating disease. On average, three out of every 10 people who got it died. And those who survived were usually left with scars, which were sometimes severe. One of the first methods for controlling the spread of smallpox was the use of variolation. In 1777, there is a written record of the decision by the parish officers in Seine to inoculate 68 people from poor families, which indicates how seriously uh, the disease was regarded. Because in that era, I don't think they were too keen on spending too much money on poor families. Variolation was replaced by vaccination in 1796, when an English doctor named Edward Jenner observed that milkmaids who got cowpox did not show any symptoms of smallpox. Variolation uses viral matter from smallpox patients, usually pus from the light case of smallpox whereas Jenner's vaccination used matter from the milder cowpox virus. Vaccination became widely accepted and gradually replaced the practice of variolation. However, the disease remained a threat and led to the building of isolation hospitals. 
Surrey placed theirs on Ripley's doorstep. In 1905, a committee purchased the site from Lord Onslow, which had both seclusion and accessibility. This plan shows it was a substantial building and the maximum number of patients treated at one time was up to 33 and the staff were brought in as and when required. The hospital never seems to have seen that many smallpox cases and there is some doubt about other infectious diseases that were treated there. But it closed for good in 1958 and later became Sen Detention Centre and is now Sen Prison. Having survived the horrors of World War I, the country was then hit in 1918 by the influenza pandemic the most severe pandemic in recent history, and that includes the current COVID pandemic. It was caused by an H1N1 virus. And although there is not universal consensus regarding where it came from, it spread worldwide in 1918-19. It's estimated that about 500 million people, or one third of the world's then population, became infected and the number of deaths was thought to be up to 50 million worldwide. There was no vaccine to protect against influenza and no antibiotics, so control efforts were limited. Most of the influenza outbreak disproportionately kills the young and the very old with higher survival rate of those in between. But in 1918, the flu pandemic resulted in a higher than expected mortality of young adults, possibly because of the war. Locally, Alice Charman recorded the, the flu epidemic and that many had died. She had been ill and she was looking out of her bedroom to see the flags being put up at the Talbot Hotel for the armistice celebrations which included a sing-song on the green. So here we have not a very good photo, I'm afraid, of some of the children celebrating the end of World War I. And below, I think is possibly in Rose Lane, another armistice party. But sadly, celebrations were short-lived. And she says the bells tolled every day, or almost every day, for deaths, once for a man, twice for a woman, and three times for a child, which is, must have been so poignant. In November 1918, the Woking News and Mail commented in Ripley that there had been a large number of influenza cases, particularly at Ride House School. And although this slide says it's the girls' residence, it was in fact the sanatorium for Wright House School, which is now U Tree House. So presumably that's where the children would have been taken. Right, so let's be a bit more positive. What about cures? Over the years, medical knowledge was gradually improving, but paying to see the doctor was out of the reach for most people and homemade remedies would have been the order of the day. Send can boast the creator of a commercially very successful remedy, but I have no idea how effective it was. Dr. Richard Stoughton, the son of a yeoman farmer, was born at Goodgrove in Senmarsh Road. He was orphaned young and his life changed completely when in 1679 he left the countryside to begin an eight year apprenticeship become an apothecary. And here's a, a record from the Society of Apothecaries of his apprenticeship. So it took him eight years and he uh, later, and he also became a doctor. And then he moved to Bartholomew Lane by the Royal Exchange on his admission to the society in 1687 and sat up, set up a practice there at the sign of the unicorn. And here he created an elixir that was sold successfully both at home and abroad. 
this next slide I rather love. It's a pretty cynical view of the apothecary shop with the skeleton mixing up poison in the back and all the poor people queuing up, hoping to be cured by the apothecary. According to this advertisement, his great cordial elixir had six certain virtues. First, it procures a strong appetite and helps the digestion and takes away the loathing of sickness, especially after a surfeit of hard drinking. So in other words, it was a hangover cure by the sound of it. It's an excellent thing. Secondly, in hypochondriac and hysteric vapors in men and women, quickly raising and briskening press spirit. It procures sweet breath and counters unsavory belching. It kills all manner of worms in children and others. It preserves from infection by corrupt air or contagious distempers. And it's one of the best peculiar medicines in the world for scurvy. In other words, it cured almost everything. And it was very successful in America. And here's an advert from Salem, Massachusetts. It was sold in this distinctive bottle described as round amber, tapered from sh round shoulders to base and a long bulging neck. Its fame was so great, it created a saying recognized in dictionaries of the time, as stodgy as a stout and bottle, which was used to mean stodgy, dull or deadhead. There he sat like a stout and bottle. So you can insult a few of your friends in the pub from when we can get back to the pub. It was so successful that he patented the recipe. Three weeks before he died in 1716, the 51 year old Richard Stoughton, being somewhat indisposed of body and judging his life to be but short, made his last will and testament. And he directed that he be buried, not with pomp or show, but in Seine churchyard near my ancestors. The land and property and his itemized monetary bequests in addition to those to his wife totaled over three thousand pounds so he, he'd made a lot of money and the inscription which is on the top and is very difficult to read says here lies interred the body of richard stoughton doctor of physic later bartholomew lane london ye son of richard stoughton of this parish who departed this life the 10th of december 1716 and was buried the 16th of the same month in his 52nd year, who was famous throughout the world for his cordial elixir. So something to be proud of. Nearly 230 years later, we had an, another local medical hero emerged. I'm not saying there were none in between, but I'm only featuring these two. He was Kenneth White, who was the Ripley pharmacist during the Second World War. Penicillin had been discovered in 1928, but was not exploited until 1939, following the work of Howard Florey and Ernst Chain. The production of penicillin became a wartime priority, and the pharmaceutical factories in the USA, UK and Russia made quantities of penicillin, which were used to save the lives of wounded soldiers. In April 1944, with makeshift kit and an ice cream refrigerator borrowed from a local shop, Kenneth White, in his pharmacy at Ripley, became the first civilian chemist manufacturer of penicillin filtrate. The early penicillin was not suitable for injection. It was not pure enough, I think. So White made it into a cream and gave it away to local doctors and hospitals. Those of you who know John Hudson will say that it was as well he did, for if he had been found to make money from it, it seems the authorities would have taken action against him. As it was, they came and inspected his premises, 
which is here in, in Ripley, and let him carry on. So that's just a summary of not entirely the whole of the exhibition, but a summary of some of the main parts of it. We hope that the vaccines for COVID will all bring us out of limbo as soon as possible. They may not be a cure as such, but probably work better than Brussels sprouts. This was one of those things that we were sent that appealed to me. So anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you, Claire. That was wonderful. I think, Claire, you might reasonably unmute us all and if people treat it carefully and raise their hands before saying anything, we can just say, say good night to each other and thanks for coming. And Anybody got anything they want to say? Thank you, Claire. That was very interesting. Um, thank you. Thank you, Claire. That was, that was brilliant. My dad was a soldier, infantry soldier in World War I, and he met mum in Northumberland in 1918. They were married in late 1918 and my eldest bro was born in 19. And I, we, I was always obviously subjected to a lot of family history because of the huge distances in, in age between my dad and my granddad and that sort of thing. But the, the fact is, I do not remember in any reminiscence the flu epidemic being mentioned. So I wonder if having, uh, and they, they would be living in either Tyneside some of the time, but then move back to Derbyshire. My mum, who liked the disaster, would have mentioned uh, <laughs> the, you know, the dreadful flu epidemic. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know the, um, how, how widespread, uh, you know, I mean, obviously it was widespread across the world. And I think yeah. the, the, the feeling is that it, it affected sort of adults worse because they were run down after the war. They probably had poor diets and so on. So, um, you know, maybe if they, they were just lucky and, you know, it's if you're out in the country, you're less likely to pick it up. I don't know whether it hit towns it, yeah. more. It was never mentioned specifically, but it's pretty clear that my mum and dad had a very good diet, even though they were um, on the poor end of poor. But for example, mm. my mum uh, was a seaside girl and used to go fishing with her dad in a little coracle. So they were eating fish daily and that uh, they were probably quite mm. strong in, in the sense of, of diet and, and wellness. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I do. I've just had a look online and in Newcastle, apparently 1,037 people died of influenza in 1918 and another 500 died in 1919. Oh. And up, up in Durham, it was nearly 3,000 in, in oh. 1918 and another 1,500 odd in 1990. I just think 19. I just think right. the uh, the idea of the bells tolling in Ripley must have been very chilling. Mm. Yeah. Maybe, Bob, they, they didn't talk about it much because it was just what happened. Yeah. 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 Vivian? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, my, my, my father died last year, aged 100, and before he died, I asked him about the Spanish flu because he, he, was a, he didn't die till April, and you'd have thought if it, you know, they would have talked about it in his childhood. He had no memory whatsoever of anybody ever talking about it. And I think his grandmother died of Spanish flu. Mm. So it wasn't that it didn't affect his family. I just think it, life just went on. And hopefully I think, the same. I, think, I think people have been so traumatised by the war and mm. so many people have died mm. in the war mm. that almost it was almost just you know, as you say, yeah. they just got on with it. It was just another yeah. death. I mean, it, it is terrible, but they were probably just punch drunk by how many people had, had gone. And I, think I also there, think there we, will other forget. Things. we will forget in time. It'll be a distant memory and other bits of our life will take over uh, in the same way. I don't think in five years we'll be talking in the same way as we are now. Listen, everybody, I'm, I'm sure loads of you have not yet had your dinner. 
it's been really good of you to come along tonight. I'd just like to thank everyone for their support. And, and I really, really look forward to seeing you all in the flesh before too long. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Thanks, everyone. Guys. See you Bye. soon. Bye. 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 Is this a sore throat? Is this just allergies? Caught in a lockdown. No escape from reality. Don't touch your eyes, just hand sanitize quickly.